This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. I am Mike Keith. This is so much fun to be joined by my fellow play-by-play announcers from the AFC South, Frank Frangie, Jacksonville Jaguars. How are you? I'm well. Good Thank you for you. doing this. I love doing this. I look forward to it. Matt Taylor. How are we doing? Indianapolis Colts. And the champ, he's here. The champ is here. <laughs> That's got Mark, the belt. Mark Vandermeer, Houston Texans, congratulations on being the AFC South champion. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for doing this. This is a wonderful yeah. thing that we all do. And who would have thunk it, huh, that yeah. I'd be sitting here with the uh, title in yeah. hand. Yeah, yeah. Frank, I, I, thought we I had wrestled it. it away from you. Yes, you did. <laughs> Personally. We, we didn't have a good last month. We, we handed it over the last month, I we think. Have, we have so much to do with the wins and losses, yeah, yeah, don't we? Yeah, but. That doesn't mean we can't claim them. Yeah, Mark, you I can, can tell you this. Claim. I sounded much better this year. I don't know what it was. People <laughs> right, were complimenting right, yeah, yeah. me. More Great people job. listened. Yeah. Like, you know, last year we got blown out in some game, and right. I thought I did a pretty good broadcast, but it doesn't matter. I get it. This is what it's about, and it's wonderful. Winning and losing is so underrated towards the perception of your performance. No course. question. No it's question. It's crazy oh, yeah. right. how that factors in for people. Uh, we've all had good games or, or yeah. good wins yeah. where we feel like, I can't speak for you guys, but I would imagine this be the case, where you feel like I could have done a better job oh, yeah. that day. You know, I could have done – certain calls could have nailed those better. And then you have blowouts where I, th- I thought, man – or not blowouts, but just losses where right. I thought, that was a really good broadcast. I mean, we hit on all the points. Yeah. The calls were clean. Everything was good. But – you want your team to win. That's why we are voices of the team because we want to ride those highs and not, preferably not the lows, but it makes the highs that much more appealing. And Mike's point is right. If we're winning, they love us. Okay? <laughs> and, and and if we're losing, it's the worst broadcast they ever heard. I mean, there's, there's a lot to that. Well, I mean. we do the, the thing where they put a GoPro in our booth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. do I like a call of the game dealio, mm-hmm. which is yeah. kind of, I don't know what I think of it, but they do it. It's sponsored. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. So, so well, right. It's sponsored. Yeah. And for for the people listening, that's a big deal to right. what we do. Right. Anytime you say something is sponsored, you have Mark Vandermeer's reaction, which is good. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Well, but that means. That Job means, security. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That means you got to have one every Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you win, right? And it's like there's a touchdown pass, and mm-hmm. and it's exciting and whatever, and you know you see the comments. Oh, it's so fun, and we really enjoy it. You lose, yeah. Why, why are you posting yeah. this? Yes. Why, yes. why, 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 why are you celebrating mediocrity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. I, we only, I think ours only goes out. That part only goes out kind of like when we win. Oh, so nice. Yeah. Okay, good but for be- you. <laughs> but the beauty of the GoPros is fantastic because it's not like these booths have a. Pro, GoPro spot. Right. So right. some go here. <laughs> right. For a while they go over here. Oh, I know. And it was yeah. perfect because then it had a great shot of my bald spot. <laughs> right back here. Okay. So maybe we can move it down just a hair. Yeah. Just a little bit. We have a ball with that as well. So you were going to say, Matthew? Well, I was just going to agree that when you win, I mean, you guys experience this too. When you win, Monday is so much easier. Talking oh. to the coach, getting coffee, the water cooler yeah. in the break room. I mean, that, that's that's the joy of it is you, you come back on Monday and everything's a little bit smoother. People are more inclined to give you more. So the Monday show, the coach's show, is a better show following a win as well. Oh, no question. I think one thing, though, that we go through being around on Mondays is that win or lose – they jump into next week so fast yeah. yes. because they have to. Right. It, it, it's like a two-hour window. Yeah, you think about what they're going through as coaches, especially players, maybe a little bit different. But as coaches, they got to move, win or lose. They got to move into next week. It's over. Just shove it aside. Yeah. Move into next week. But they do like talking about the wins more. And you know, we all know how to ask the questions. And I think these are important questions. You know, what did you do well that you can carry forward? What you, do you need to improve upon? There are ways to handle it because I know you guys get peppered with this. Are there things you can't say? Right. Are there things you can't talk about? Are your questions handed to you? Are they scripted for right. you? <laughs> no one has ever said anything to me about anything. But, yeah. you know, and I think we're all similar in this way. My whole career I've been the voice of a team, you know, and I've always known how to handle those things. Right. And when you're doing basketball, I mean, I did a 3-23 and basketball team once, at a, once upon a time. 
of time. You know, you ha- learn how to ask the creative questions in, in that environment. When your team is losing, I say this to everybody too, in our digital, social, every department that does team-related content, when you lose, you will get better at your craft. Oh, yeah. That will improve you even more than winning. And my, and my situation, Mark's a little different. You guys work for the teams. I don't work for the team, so I, I, I come in for the game. Yeah, but you kind of yeah. do. Yeah, well, well I well, do. Then you know. well, yeah, well, I, I do, but I don't. But, <laughs> but so, but to your point, mm-hmm. I think people understand that when I'm on every afternoon, I work for the team. Yeah. yeah so yeah, right. so I'm not going to ask the hard hitting. Um, how in the world could you have blitzed in that situation? Sure. Well, that's not my job. But who and does so, that? Who yeah. does? My rebuttal yeah. is this. Who does ask those questions? Right. I'm thinking, hey, Mr. Talk Radio Guy, go to the press conference. Yeah. Right. You've got access right. to these people, to the head coach. You could ask them yourself the tough question. But you don't. most of these guys don't have the guts to show up at the presser yeah. and ask those yeah. questions that they're throwing out to their audience rhetorically yeah. on the air. They'll play the, they'll play the fluff sound bite from the day before and then rip it for three and hours on it. Monday. Go yeah. to the press conference. Right. But there are certain questions you always have to ask. I don't know if you guys – do you do a post-game interview immediately after with the coach? I, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. No. No. Next day. No. I yeah, do. It's next day. Yeah. So, okay. I, w- I would – you know, and, and I'm going to ask if there's something involving the quarterback, mm-hmm. if he throws four touchdown passes, yeah. right. if he throws four interceptions, if he gets hurt. There's going to be a quarterback question. Yeah, you have to do that. <laughs> you know why? Because the fans are interested in the quarterback. That's right. It's a thing. Yeah. And so Mike Vrabel, he would get so mad at me because he would say, you know, I would say, is, is Will Levis okay or is Ryan Tannehill, is he going to, you know, do we have a report on him yet after right. injury? And he would, no, I get the same thing every time. And he, he finally, you know, sort of said to me at one point, he goes, why, you know I'm not going to answer that. Why do you ask? And I, and I explained it to him. It's kind of the job. Yeah. Right. You know, it's not the hard-hitting, crazy, whatever. It's just you know these right. are things that the fan base is going to want to know. And so if we have to go through the dance of me asking and you not answering, fine. Right. That's okay. Yeah, if that's what you want to do, but just understand to do my job. And he totally got that. You got to ask the question. Right. And yeah. he got to lob it in there. He totally understood. He was like, okay, I, I get it. You yeah. know, I, I, I get why you feel like you have to do that from the fans' perspective because that's who you do it for. We, and I think most of us, I'm, I th- I'm pretty sure this case with you three guys right now, and I know it is with me, we have good coaches. We, I mean, mm. our guy to work with. Doug Peterson's fantastic, and I get the and I get the sense you and I've talked about D'Amico, yeah, and and, and I know you you getting to know Shane Steichen, mm-hmm. and so and so you're getting a new a new coach mm-hmm. with Brian, but but we're we're lucky there. It's not the old school guy as much. We've all had that guy probably, but it's not the old school guy as much that you go, okay, I'm going to ask this question. He's going to jump it in here. Well, I don't think we in today's day and age, certainly in our division, I don't think we have that. I think no. we have pretty good coaches. No, I mean with with Frank and now with Shane. Um, I, I've never had a situation where I felt like I couldn't ask a question right. because it was kind of towing the line in terms of the seriousness, the severity of it. They know that we have a job to do, and right. it's our mm-hmm. name on the show, right? It's, it's you know, Colts Roundtable Live with Matt Taylor. So there's an integrity aspect of, his, of it as well. There's a journalistic uh, component to it too where you have to ask the questions, to your point, Mike, that the fans want to know. And I think the guys that I've dealt with, Frank, Chris, now Shane, um, they've all been incredibly supportive of me doing my job. And I've never been called to the principal's office because as long as you're objective and as long as you're fair, they know you got a job to do. I think with the tough questions, whether it's uh, why did you go for it on fourth and one or something like that or what is the health or whatever situation might present itself, you give them the opportunity to answer a question. And then you don't drive it home. Right. Uh, when I was at UMass, you know, Calipari was there. The year before, the play-by-play guy at the Calipari show pressed him on a suspended player and just kept saying, hey, these fans are all here for an answer, and I think you got to give them more. Like, he said stuff like that. So that's how you got the job. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> might have, might have right been one place, of the right time. Right. to it. <laughs> sure. But I learned then and, and other times that, yeah, you have to just throw right. it out there Give them the chance to answer, but you don't press them. It's their show. That's the other thing people don't realize. 
it's the D'Amico Ryan show right, that we're right. doing. So we're not here to, you know, cook and, and, and showcase ourselves and our Mike Wallace, Jim Gray abilities. Yeah. Jim the, Gray back the in the day because the Brady interviews are not are not the Jim Gray that we grew right, up right, with, right? Right. Mm-hmm. right. They're, they're, they're softball. And it's nice. It's a good podcast. But I'm listening to Jim Gray now. It's like, and we got Tommy here. And, Tommy, what would you think of that? Uh, back in the day, Jim <laughs> Gray used to press people beyond right. belief. Yeah, I mean, he was like Sam Donaldson. Yeah. He was the Sam Donaldson of sports. Yeah, that's right. Sam Donaldson. People, people listening right now have no idea. <laughs> I might as well right. have mentioned right. the payphone. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Marconi invented. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> All right. So, Mark Vandermeer, you're the champion. You get to lead. What do you want to throw out? This is what we did last year. We yeah. just threw out questions or topics. What do you want to know from the group or one member of the group or – all right, I want to know from Frank. Yeah. Frank Frangie. How are they going to bounce back? How, yeah. What? What? Because they flipped the script. Yeah. They had a bad start in 22, great finish, great start in 23, and a bad finish. Yeah. So what's the script going to be this year, and how do they flip it? Here's what or I think. Or flip it to a, a consistency. Y- yeah, throughout. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, listen, the Jags haven't been very good for a lot of years. We all know mm-hmm. that. I think they now have a pretty good team. Yeah. I, I think I think we have a pretty good team. It's a winning season yeah. still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, right. Well, to, to put it in perspective for you, since the turn of the century in the last 24 years, this franchise has had six winning seasons. Okay? He's had mm. two of them. All right? So so he's a pretty good coach. Wow. They've got a pretty good roster, Mark. I think, listen, it got, when it, you, we've all seen it. When it starts going downhill, it starts going downhill. You lose. Guys lose confidence. You get some guys injured. They had a bad five weeks. Mm-hmm. There, there's, there's no getting around it. And the five weeks, they started eight and three. They were on top of the world. It looked like they were going to cruise to the division title, and then we kind of – everything went wrong. I think they've got a pretty good team. They've got to get better at the line of scrimmage. When playing the Titans, trying to trying to get – just just after all the bad that happens, win that game and you win the division. And the Titans gutted them up front. Derrick Henry's still running. You know, and, 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 and the Jags couldn't run and couldn't stop, and that has been their thing. So I think making the line of scrimmage, giving you a long answer, short question, I'm a radio guy, that's what we do. I think, uh, I, I think getting better at the line of scrimmage is the big thing, getting the receivers healthy. They've got, they're they're going to change. You know, they brought in uh, Ryan Nielsen, a brand-new defensive coordinator. I think they're going to change. They brought in a whole new staff. Uh, defensively, so I think they're going to change what they do. But Mark, they've got to get better at the line of the line of scrimmage. It's still it's still a line of scrimmage sport. As much as we love our quarterbacks and we love seeing the ball fly all over, the guy that's toughest at the line of scrimmage usually wins the game. As good as Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes is, usually, yeah. The Chiefs are physical, man. They mm-hmm. might have had the best defense in football, and they and they won because of that physicality. And right. so, uh, yeah. that's what the Jags have to do better. And, and that's the hope is that mm-hmm. if they get more, they've got the quarterback. He was up and down, but they got the quarterback. They've, they, they've got a pretty good receiver room. The back end of the defense isn't bad. They've got to get more physical. I, that's what I think they'd have to do. To Sounds question, good. To your question. All right, Matt Taylor. Oh, boy. What do you, last year you threw out booth positions. I did. Which, was a, yeah. which yeah. ended up being a great topic. <laughs> I'm sure everyone who listened <laughs> yeah. went Evergreen, click, yeah. click, yeah. click. Sorry. No, but it, it, it sabotaged the podcast. podcast stuff. In that, that, yeah, I mean, yeah. Was, yeah well, sorry. you, you got to go inside baseball yeah. a little bit, yeah. for sure. <laughs> but it was a good topic. There well, you go. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I mean, even before Matt goes, let me just say about that topic. I can't tell many people asked me, he said, did you guys – did rain really fall on Matt when he was doing the broadcast? Remember you said – the Yes. Okay. And I said, well, you have to understand. <laughs> yeah. you, you know how at Iowa – the opponents, they, they, the, the coach would, uh, Ferentz would paint the visiting locker room pink. Yeah, yeah Hayden Fryer well, originally. Right, 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 yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we drenched the opposing broadcaster. That's, it's, 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 it's <laughs> I still all have part the picture it's on all, my phone. There's a bucket next to me just collecting it's water. All, it's all part of the psychological play. <laughs> so uh, we had yeah. a lot of fun. Week 17, yeah. 2019, right. I think it was, like a monsoon yeah. in the Not booth. Not that he remembers. But, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so what you want me to throw it to yeah, somebody anybody, else? Anybody, just the whatever. Ball, the ball's in my court. Just now. whatever yeah. you want to talk here. about. Yeah. Well, I'll throw it back to you, Mike. I mean, we, we talked yesterday about a new regime and you know passing of the torch from Ryan Tannehill to Will Levis. Let me ask you: in this first off season, from one regime to the next, what does what does the ideal off season look like for the Titans going it's, into year one? With, it's with Brian? literally the most interesting off season this franchise has ever had. Um, because this franchise, and I told Frank this yesterday, this franchise had seven straight playoff teams as the Houston Oilers from 1987 to 1993. Mm-hmm. They were so not ready for the salary cap to come in in 1994, they had to take the Warren Moon teams apart. And so 
The Oilers, then moving to Tennessee and becoming the Titans, have always been behind the eight ball on the salary cap. Always. Mm. We've had moments where we've been a little in front of it, but it's like we've always been playing catch-up. This year, with $80 million or whatever it is, this is the first time ever we've been able to reset what we're going to do with the salary cap. So you're making a Derrick Henry decision about more than him. Are you going to pay a running back? Right. Are you going to pay corners? Are you going to pay wide receivers? Who are you going to pay mm-hmm. as you stack it going forward? If we have our guy at quarterback in Will Levis, which we hope we do, then you don't have to pay him for two more years. And mm-hmm. so you can set this cap to when it's time to pay him, if you hope you have to, you can do it without breaking up the club. So not only does it turn with Brian Callahan coming in for Mike Vrabel, it turns because the Titans are in a position where I think they're resetting their whole plan for the first time that we've ever seen. Sure. And it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see what's done in free agency and then how that affects the draft. How do they play the seventh pick? They don't have a third-round pick because they traded that three last year to go up and get Levis in round two. Mm. So do they try to back up and and go get that? At seven, you may have a chance to back up because somebody may want the third or fourth quarterback. Right. 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 And we're hoping we don't need a quarterback. So, you know, there are a lot of things you're staking right here. And then Brian Callahan comes in, very different from Mike Vrabel. I mean, way different. Unbelievable staff yeah. that he has brought in, especially his dad, uh, be, to get Denard Wilson to, to run the defense and then to get his dad to run the offensive line is just crazy good. And so now we're sort of going, going to see. But the nice thing that these people have is they're not going to have to take this thing all the way down to the studs. I mean, no offense, Frank, but they showed in the last game of the season – that they can still play. The culture's right. not broken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Vra- Vrabel didn't have a locker room problem, and they're not going to have to jettison a whole bunch of guys because they're troublemakers. Still, they've got a lot of work to do, and it's it's going to be so much fun to see them do this work. That, great stuff. I, I I got one. Okay. Let, let me go to quarterbacks because I think I think our division with quarterbacks is fascinating. Uh, we like our guy. Uh, he, he had a tough year last year. He played through an ankle, a knee, a shoulder, a concussion. He really did. Yeah. It, was, it was a hard year. I still and, love it. Yeah, he, I think he's going to be so good. But I love where we are. I, I told you guys this story last year when we did this. I caught a college game two years ago, and I, we had the off week, so I had Ohio State, Maryland. And so I went to College Park, Maryland, did the college game, and I saw Strouds. And also saw Talia Tungavailoa, the little to his little brother, who was yeah. very good. Right. It's like a 38-35 game. But I remember thinking – God, is that guy good? Mm-hmm. And I told you guys this. I thought, I thought he was better than Bryce Young. It's easy to say that now, but we, we had this conversation. Yeah. The way he saw the field, some of the throws he made, you don't make at the college level. So I'm not, I wasn't shocked, Mark, that, that he turned out to be what he was. I, I'm not surprised. I, I think it sounds like it's easy to say now, but I, but I sure. told you last year, I was not surprised that C.J. Stroud became all that. So let's go around the room. You guys go around. I want you to go first because you got the guy. Did you think he would be that good? What's he like to deal with? Um, tell me about, and I'm going to ask you about Anthony, too, sure. who I do know a little bit. But let's start with you. Tell me all about C.J. Stroud because he's a cool story and a great player. Well, I had no idea it'd be this good, all right, this good, this early, or maybe ever. I, don't, I didn't know what to expect. You never know with these guys, yeah. right? I thought he'd be pretty good, and I thought I had high hopes for Bobby Slowick, the offensive coordinator. Yeah. I thought they'd organize a good system. The quarterback could be successful enough. I thought they'd run the ball a lot better, and he'd feed off that. First time I meet C.J. Stroud, he said, he said well, all right, what's your name? He wanted it again. What do you do here? You know, he yeah. wanted to yeah. know. Yeah. Like, this is like D'Amico was when he was a rookie. Right. He wanted to understand people in the organization who were around him and what everybody did because that's the kind of person he is in a professional environment. And Ohio State is a very professional environment. And these college teams, they'll have pro personnel departments now, so they're basically pro teams. Right. So he comes in and he fits right in. And you see the guy. He's very genuine. He and Will Anderson on draft night, that was real special. And they bookended it. 
fit with the NFL honors, winning offensive and defensive rookie of the year. Anyway, as CJ starts to play, we could see it, and we talked about this week two against the Colts. We lost the game, but he throws for well over 300, and you're thinking – He's making a lot of throws. He can yeah, play. Right. And then we beat the Jags down right, there right. And in lopsided fashion. And I thought, okay, this guy's good. And then we blow out the Steelers at home. And I thought, okay, we've got our guy. And I didn't know where it was going to go from there. We lost to Atlanta, but he played pretty well. Uh, we had a bad game against Carolina on the road. But I thought I, I never worried about that. That was a hiccup. Then when we beat Tampa Bay, the way he did that, leading him downfield in 45-ish seconds, uh, and, and hitting it 10 seconds to go, he's snapping the ball and, and hitting Tank Dell for the game winner. I thought, this is it. So all throughout the year, he kept getting better, too. What do we always say? You got to improve. No matter who you are, you got to get better. He kept getting better. And then I thought when he got the concussion, it was actually, I don't want to call it blessing in disguise, but I think being off his feet, being out of the building for a, a week or two, just cle- you know, clearing his head, I hate to use that terminology, but just – Sure. enabling his body to yeah, heal while right. his brain was getting better his body's healing too and then we had a fan, fantastic finish really but lost to the Ravens so uh, I, I had no idea Frank but I like what I'm seeing yeah, <laughs> and, and, this is and, very and, good and you should tell me now Anthony Richardson is a wonderful kid he's got to stay on the field right no, I mean no, I, no. I think that would be the question no, tell no. me about getting to know him a little bit and what are your expectations well, I have similar experiences as Mark. I mean, he is he just turned 21. He's 21 yeah. years old in, in May. And you talk about all the expectations, the face of a franchise. Now you're the, the, the marketing face of an NFL team, and you played 13 games coming out of, out of college. And he was sensational in the first month of the oh, season. Yeah. You know, that, that first, yeah. that, that week two game that Mark alluded to, I mean, Anthony Richardson is, is – He's making people miss. I mean, he had he had four rushing touchdowns in the first four games of the season. Right. Um, obviously, he goes down in week five. Uh, if you look at the totality of the season, he played 173 snaps, which is about 15% of the overall offensive snaps for the season. So there's no question that when he comes back next year, he's going to have to kind of retool his rookie season. But what I told Mark yesterday was, when you watched him in OTAs, when you watched him in spring, when you watched him in training camp, rarely did he not go to the right place with the football. I think that's the thing that surprised me the most with Anthony Richardson is that he's a much better passer. He's more accurate than I thought he would be. He's more calm in the pocket than I thought he would be. But the Colts don't want this past season and this experience with him getting banged up because he had the concussion. He had the ankle, so right. he missed a lot of time. He had like four injuries in four games. He only completed one game, 60 minutes full, one time. That was the week four game, I think, against the Rams. But what they don't want to do to Anthony Richardson is curb his playing style. They don't want to change what he does and what makes him special. But the contrarians around town are saying you got to teach him to right. slide and you got to protect him better. Well, let me jump in, Matt, because the play he was injured on that ended the season that was that was nothing. It out was of the an norm. it was an innocuous, right. very much so. I mean, Harold Landry didn't hit him dirty, 100%. or it right. wasn't. I mean, he just got tackled. He landed was, on the shoulder. He landed yeah. on the shoulder, right. and that that would worry me. Yeah, you know, because it, if if he'd been hit or bent in an unusual way, or right. I yeah. mean, sometimes you see the injury, you say, "Well, that's weird. That's yeah. why that happened." This was just a normal play, right? And you don't want to take anything away from his ability to be special because right. that's why you drafted him where you did. And I told Mark yesterday, I really think that based on everything you heard at the end of the draft last year, the comments and some of the innuendos, I really do think if the Colts were picking first overall last year that Anthony Richardson was their guy because wow. they think that he has the highest ceiling. He can do things that right. C.J. Stroud couldn't do. Now, obviously, C.J. Stroud is – he's he's C.J. Stroud. He turned into a fantastic player, and the Colts are going to have to contend with that for the next decade or so. Um, but I think what you're going to see is from the Colts, I think you're going to see Shane Steichen be a little bit more tactful, uh, a little bit more – I don't know what the right word would be, uh, a little bit more precise, I guess, in how you use Anthony Richardson, kind of like how the Ravens use Lamar Jackson. Give the ball to your best player when the field shrinks or when it's a third and short and you got to have a moment right inside the red zone when yards are hard to come by. That's when I think you're going to see more of the design runs from Anthony Richardson. But it's really fun to think about 
the potential of Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson in the same backfield because those two guys together last year because of Taylor's saga off right. the field and then Richardson's injury, those two guys can play, uh, played a combined two snaps together last year. Wow. Yeah, so the, virtually nothing. So there's a lot of excitement on – what the box would look like against the run uh, if you're playing the Colts. I mean, how do you defend Jonathan yeah. Taylor? How do you f- defend Anthony Richardson? Maybe you get Michael Pittman Jr. back on the franchise tag or you extend him so you have that reliable pass catcher, that physical wide receiver. But I think more so than anything within the passing game, the Colts need some more pop on the outside, some more explosive plays. But long-winded answer to your question, I think Anthony Richardson is so much more – poised, mature beyond his years, and just really exciting what he can do because you guys know within the Colts franchise, it's been Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck and Jim Harbaugh. The Colts have never had anything close to a quarterback like Anthony Richardson. And based on his skill set and what we're seeing now in the NFL, I think you have to have what he can do to a degree to win big in the NFL. Well, these everyone, days. every quarterback's got to be able to move now. Everyone, mm-hmm. but to your point, right? Which takes us to I know you love your guy. Will Levis is physical. He's a bodybuilder. He's a big physical guy. He's athletic as heck. You really like him. Tell us about Will Levis. Cause I, cause well, the first time you and I talked about him, yeah. you had a little glow about you. Yeah, about I this liked guy. him early on because in the rookie minicamp when we saw him throw, yeah, we've never had a guy with this arm. Mm. You're like, oh. Okay. I mean, it, you'd see Tannehill throw, and Tannehill has a good arm. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's great. And Malik Willis has a good arm, and you're like, okay, well, that's impressive. And then you see this, and you're like, what was that? Yeah. Um, it's a howitzer. I mean, it's, yeah. it's crazy good. To your point, though, about mobility, you know, what's funny about that is when we had the good offenses 2019 through 2021, Ryan Tannehill was running. Yeah. Wasn't, yeah. wasn't 20 times a game, wasn't 10 times a game. It was always on third down. It was yeah. third it down. Everybody. Yeah. Or yeah. in the red Breaking zone. Conversions. Or yeah. in the red zone. I mean, yeah. he, he in 2021, he rushed for seven touchdowns. And that's most, a big number that's for a, a quarterback. Uh, well, yeah, well, well, especially for a guy who was – He was a receiver. Yeah. He was a receiver yeah. his first two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but then in 2022 and 2023, he didn't run anymore. And mm. so – that aspect of it being out was a was a big deal. Some of it was due to an ankle. And right, right. I'm not blaming him, but I agree. You've got to have somebody who can move. Levis can move, too. He's not a runner, per se, but is he going to be able to take off when it opens up on third and ten and get your 15 yards? Yeah. Yeah. Because he's yeah. got good speed yeah. and, and he's athletic. Now, we don't need him trying to run over people. Uh, because Levis's whole thing is his intensity is yeah. uh, through the roof. And that's one thing they've had to try to rein in because at Kentucky, things would go wrong and he would kind of get down on himself. Okay. And they had to say, listen, this is the NFL, friend. I mean, it's – it's you are going to throw a bad ball play to play. Uh, right, I yeah. mean, you you are. I mean, this is going to happen. You got to you got to shake it off. And we saw in a couple of instances where he made a couple bad plays. The Miami game on Monday night where he made a couple of bad plays, and yet he came back and led the victory at the end. Which getting the victory was great, and doing it, you know, two touchdowns in the last four minutes. But to me, the bigger thing were, was the way that he flipped it around. Yeah, and you know. Pete Rose used to talk about a lot of the success in hitting for him was if you start 0 for 2 or 0 for 3 and you end up three for five, 2 for 5 or 3 for 5. You come back and you put the earlier at-bats right. out of the way. And, and I think that's a lot of what he's having to learn. He's super smart. I mean, crazy smart. And remember, he played for pro-style kind of guys at not only Kentucky, but also at Penn State. Mm. Uh, He's an older guy. You know, he's not 21. He's 24. And so he's seen a couple things. He's had a couple bad things happen. Um, And that that actually helps. I I think having the adversity, the, the adversity of the NFL is the toughest thing for any player. But at the quarterback position, it's like, way up and here. how you overcome it right you said yeah, it. yeah. How, how do you bounce back from that I'm curious about this with the Titans though because to me and I don't know how you guys feel but I might have talked about this last year as an announcer I gauge certain things this is one of my meters my 
terror meter when that player is on the field. And I had it with <laughs> Peyton about Manning. Last year, yeah. I had it with Steve McNair back in the day with yeah. the Titans playing quarterback. Certain players, you know, terrify you when they're on the field. It's third and six. You're like, I know they're going to get this. I'm talking offense here. Yeah. And Derrick Henry is maybe maybe he's the only non-quarterback right. to fit this bill, although Jonathan Taylor comes close. Derrick Henry in the backfield is frightening to me. Sure. Right. I, at any down, and we talked about this last week, why even take him off the field on third down? I, I know totally you're going to wear him out, but just leave him on the field. He's frightening. The yeah. defense doesn't always do what the defense doesn't want. Right. They don't want to see Derrick Henry ever. <laughs> I always said that the Titans do everybody a favor by taking Derrick Henry off. Yeah, the yeah it's yeah. like, yeah. okay, great. Thank you for I know, Derrick. you know, Spears can catch the ball, but – Listen, it should be a running down third and five or less with right. Derrick Henry. He can pick it up. Right. Well, our problem was we weren't getting to third and five sure. or less. Yes. Well, yeah. that's sure. right. Yeah, I, that's what has crushed us the last two years is everybody would put 14 guys in the box on first down. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you were lucky if you got back to the line of scrimmage or you gained a yard. And then you're in a situation. And, and if, you, if it wasn't second and 12 – if it was really second and nine, they might run him again. Right. Mm-hmm. And it might be third and four, and then third and four is a down. You can do a lot of different yep. things, especially when Tannehill was running. Mm-hmm. And so now, you know, that element is gone, and you're in third and eight plus, and he's not a receiver. No, no, you yeah. can't do that. And the other thing, too, is – in Uly or at Alabama, they would have been crazy to spend a lot of time with him on pass protection. Right. Sure. Yeah, that's right. The, so, and they, they did. So Derek's thing about pass protection, we all know he's a tough guy. Nobody's saying he's afraid to block anybody, but that's a feel thing. Yeah. Understanding thing. where people are going to be coming from. Yeah. A lot of guys can't right. do it. Well, Tajay Spears can Tajay Spears can sense, okay, the guy's going to be coming from my right or I need to step up here. He's got that. Derek was never trained in that way. He's also not a receiver who runs 10 routes. He basically runs a screen pass and then some sort of swing or whatever. And so from that standpoint, that's when when it was third and seven or more, he had to come off the field. Well, 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 let me tell you about you you fearing Derek Henry. Let me give you a scenario. Week 18? It's the last (laughs) game of the year. (laughs) Everybody says he's over the hill, although he's second in the league in rushing. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, he's not coming back. It's his last game ever. The whole the whole city of Nashville is out. The, every citizen of Nashville is at the game, okay? Yeah. The only game I've ever seen with 8 million people at the game. And they're all Derrick Henry fans. You could feel it. I, I'm telling you, when you're the play-by-play guy of the other team, where he's from. Yeah. 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 And so he's from our – Mike, I could feel that. I know. I, I was nervous when I saw him come out and he's celebrating. I'm like – it was kind of a. I knew it was going to be one of those days. It was it, a, you just, it, I'm telling you, Matt, you felt it yeah. before the game started. Right. Not, not. I didn't know if we were going to lose or what, but but Derrick Henry was going to go nuts. You yeah. just, you just had. Did you have that feeling? It was a Kobe Bryant moment. It, it was. And I, I mean, it's what yeah. it was. I mean, and you, we got to be the other team. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> where he's from, <laughs> you right. know. I mean, unfortunately, I, you were the Washington Generals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, 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 that I mean, that's a, and I, and I remember thinking. This is. I mean, that's how. But to your point about fearing, mm-hmm. I agree. That's a great description. Yeah. Because. Here we go, and I and I think the first carrier to him, like, and I, and the your line wasn't very good. No, but they blocked like the greatest line of all time that day because they're blocking for Derrick. They're Henry. blocking yeah. for Derrick Henry, I mean, and they know he has. You know, they know they yes. understood what it was. You could and really I really feel that. You and could I, really feel that that day. It was. I mean, for us as broadcasters, you love to do players like this. Because it's like, this is going to be a Hall of Fame player. His yep. five years, yeah. Oh, yeah. if you take from the, the Jacksonville game on the Thursday night, December 6, 2018, through the end of last season, there have not been five other running backs have a five years like he did in NFL history. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that t- does it. That yeah. puts you in. Yeah, right, you're, you're talking about Jim Brown. Yeah. You're talking about uh, yeah. O.J. Simpson. You're talking about LaDainian Tomlinson, right. Adrian Peterson. I mean, to average over 100 yards rushing per game yeah. for over five years is crazy. The the most 200-yard games in NFL history, a 2,000-yard 2000 2000 season. season. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of those He's things. He's one of the greatest ever, period. One, one of the really greatest. Is. And really so is. you're sitting here and you're thinking, how blessed am I that mm-hmm. I have gotten to call yeah. these yep. plays? Yeah. I mean, what a gift this is. And then in this moment, I mean, you understand, the Titans are at a different place. Derek's at a different place. Right. 
I mentioned earlier you're resetting your cap for the first time in your yeah. history in a broad way with a lot of new people. Rand Carthon didn't bring him in. Brian yeah. Callahan's yeah. never coached him. Chad Brinker, the president of football operations, has no tie. To, I mean, it's all – And he plays running back and he's getting And older. he plays That's running back, right. a, a position that – Which it, sucks. Well, it yeah. does. It sucks. It does, but it is a devalued position. But it's the in world we're of, in. Yeah. It's the world we're in. It starts with the seven-on-seven yeah. seven with the high school kids. Right, yeah. right. There's no Derrick Henry playing seven-on-seven. <laughs> right. seven. right. No, you're right. That means, so it's there. So you're walking into Nissan Stadium that day. And you're saying, this is going to be special. Yeah. Because you hit it, Frank. There's no way that crowd should have been what it was that day. There, right. There's no way. But I mean, they knew it was like a bowl game. They, you could feel it. Well, it, it's a moment. It's an athlete has bonded with a city over an eight-year period. And there's such respect for him. He's a Heisman Trophy yeah. winner. And, and he's a great dude. He's a great dude. That's the and thing, And the too. other thing, too, at the trade deadline in 2018 – when he was the Titans' third-string running back because he was in a horrible slump, they couldn't find anybody that wanted to trade for him. Wow. Yeah. And what so did he – So this is 2018. So is DeMarco Murray still there? Yeah. Well, yeah. At, at this point, it's Deion Lewis. Okay. So Deion Lewis is the first-string running back. David Fluellen is getting snaps over Derrick Henry – it's crazy at this point oh gosh, because yeah. Derek is is just he's in a slump. And Lafleur is the offensive coordinator. Yeah, and and I mean, th- listen, they weren't making a mistake not playing him. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and they couldn't figure out how to get him going. Well, what does this guy do? He's this big star. He's the all time leading rusher in high school history. Mm-hmm. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He's Derrick Henry. He's on the Nissan commercials. Yeah. Everybody knows Derrick Henry. And man, he that dude's in the tank. Yeah. And what does he do? He runs with the scout team. He goes to he do, he gets with the running That's back coach. Well, he gets with the running back coach and spends time. And he keeps working and working. They're like, you have to press the hole this way. We know you've never done it before, but you've got to learn this. And then that Thursday night game happens where he rushes for two thirty eight in the ninety nine yard run and the four touchdowns. And stiff arms to half the city. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but remember, but I mean, remember the straight arm? I, I, that's where all started. That's the night the stiff arms all started. I'm yeah. not saying this. You might have stiff armed me. I'm not saying this to hurt you. I promise. But that night was such a revelation. You're like, this all just changed. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. so then for five years. There's never there have in rare instances in the NFL history there's never been anything like it, and then fast forward a little you know five years and a month, and you come out for that game and you just know yeah mm-hmm. you just know didn't know we were gonna win yeah had no idea if we could win the ball game but it's like today this is gonna be special and it was a it was a unique experience if that's it yeah. It was a great send-off. Took the mic yeah. at the end of the game, sure. thanked the crowd. Yeah. I, I mean, you just – It looked like a send-off. And it did. Felt like one, too. And our fans in Houston, go get Derrick Henry on all the talk radio <laughs> right, lines. Right, right. Get Derrick Henry. Or, you know, they might watch Saquon Barkley. You know how yeah. fans yeah. are. It's free agency. It's like, sure. let's get the most expensive well, car. But I get it because he'd be awesome. Yeah, let me let me tie it all back, and I'm going to sabotage the podcast because okay. this is – only we care about this, but the press release, the Titans press release, you guys all read the press release. Right. I scour the press release. I'm a big dork. I read it word for word. But Derrick Henry in the Titans press release is the biggest beast of all time. And it oh, changes yeah. every single week because there's another milestone. Yeah. There's right, another right, right. accomplishment. Pages. So from that standpoint, I'm looking forward to not having to prepare <laughs> on, a, on a weekly basis for Derrick I, I Henry. I used to feel that way about the Colts release when Peyton yeah. Manning was playing. Yeah. There's a whole book on Peyton Manning with in the press release, but, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to say, ladies good. and gentlemen, it's Peyton Manning right. playing quarterback today. That's <laughs> and, all you need. And that's to know. ultimately what you end up doing. But the thing about the press release that I was so always just taken aback by when it comes to Derrick Henry, yes, the 2,000 yard seasons and all that, but the fourth quarter rushing, oh, yeah. that always stood out to me. Like yeah. the best fourth quarter uh, rushing oh, yeah. running back in the last five years. More fourth quarter rushing yards than anybody. And by the way, I was the biggest Titans fan in the world that day. It's weird I bet like you within were. our division when you have to root for an <laughs> AFC South team because, you know, I love Especially you guys. Especially you, you rooting for us. Yeah, yeah me rooting for yeah. the Titans is very weird, yes. you know. But I was like, go you know what, Titans. You know what's funny about 
all of this. Yeah. I didn't watch any. I didn't watch a minute of that game. Oh, really? I mean, we, oh, because you were so. Colts Colt yes, lost yes, the, the day I before. Right? I understand. That's I was right. working. You know, that was the whole, like, clean out your locker day. Yeah. So, like, I was consumed. Oh, yeah, you were working. So, so I, I, I didn't watch a minute of that game. I listened to you on my way to the complex. Oh, well, thank you. But that was it. I think so it's So, you nice. were the one. Good. <laughs> it's good for the division that uh, year prior, we had the Saturday night championship wow. game with Jacksonville, Tennessee, mm-hmm. and then the Colts and the Texans play. For not the division, but it turned out to be for the division. I but it was for a playoff that. berth. Yeah. It was I, cool. It's like I, Saturday yeah, night yeah. AFC South yeah. showcase. I, well, I, I, I love it that they're doing that now. I, I think that is so smart. And yeah. I love the fact that our that you know, listen, our division hasn't been the marquee division, man. And and we're headed there. I again, if Trevor's what I think he is, I think you're right. If if C.J. Stroud's what it looks like he obviously is, and two young quarterbacks in and the coaches and, too. And, yeah, yeah. The so, coaches. I mean, the I coaches. think right now we are in a. We are the, golden these are age. the golden age of this division. I well, really believe that, the, and I, that's really exciting for all of us. Here's the problem, though. Problem, I'll put that in air quotes or yeah. whatever. There, there hasn't been a Super Bowl winner, right? Yeah. We've got to get a Super Bowl winner or two would be great yeah. out of this division because people talk about the really tough divisions in football, and you look at the AFC West, the Chiefs elevate the entire division, they no do. matter how bad the other teams are or okay or whatever they are, right? right. They elevate the entire division. Uh, you look at the NFC East, well, the Eagles in recent years have elevated that division. I know the Cowboys have won a lot yeah. of regular season games lately, but I think with the AFC South, we were on a run for a while when it was still six teams going from each conference where you'd get two in from the division annually right? Yeah, right and it was flipping around a little bit and and matt pointed this out yesterday so i'm not i'm not putting salt in the wound the colts have not won the division since 2014 right is that right, right? yeah That's but and since that everybody else has won it twice at least twice yeah no and the, kidding. the texans have won it more than anybody since then right yet the Texans are the only one in the division to not make it to the AFC Championship game. Yeah. The Jags have been, the Titans have been, yeah. the Colts went in 2014. Right. So it's weird kind of, it's, weird, it's horrible for the Texans that they haven't been to an AFC Championship game. Uh, the Titans, the Oilers, right. were the last yeah. team to do it in 1979. So we have those things going that kind of keep the division down. Plus, if you're the NFC East and everybody's 500-ish, it's still attractive because they're huge markets and it's Dallas and New York and right. Blitz and Glamour and all that. But despite all, I agree with everything you said. I didn't realize those numbers so you just read them out. But we, what we have, it's still coaching quarterback more than it's ever been. It's yeah. Belichick and Brady, and it's Andy Reid and Mahomes. Yeah. That's who wins the championship. You can get to the game. You're not in this day and age. Yeah. You are not winning it in this day and age without that. Right. And we have four franchises now that might have that. That that's the point. I can tell you. I think we got that. I mm-hmm. think you got that, Mark. It looks like. I mean, we have four franchises now. Now look. Maybe these young quarterbacks don't turn out to be all that. Maybe Stroud has a sophomore slump, and I'm wrong about Trevor. And the two young guys don't. But I don't think so. And the point is, we now might have that. Well, you know, we, we, we have we have, as a, collectively as a division, we haven't had four franchises on that solid might, footing uh, at right. those, uh, those two spots. Right. But what I felt good about, from our standpoint, is when Brian Callahan comes in, initial press conference, he immediately starts talking about Will Levis as the guy. Yeah. And it's like, okay. Now, that's pretty good. Definitive. Because, yeah. yeah, because he didn't draft him. Right. And he's had some pretty good quarterbacks around in his life. And and he, he got a pretty good draft position right now. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, I mean, if, if, if we wanted to take another one, we could right now. Mm-hmm. So, for him to come in and say, yeah, yeah we're building around this well, guy. Yeah. And, and while at the combine he makes the comment, we're going to get competition, veteran competition from Malik Willis. Yeah leaving out Will Levis tot- like he's on a different level. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay. And that's and you know, that's what you that's what you want because I mean it's quarterback play. You know, Dave McGinnis, who I work with, says if you don't have a quarterback, you've got a highly paid rugby team. And you know I, I mean that's in today, a, in today I, in today's I mean, it's, football it's it. I, I might steal that line. That's a that I mean in today's football that's it's really the, right. It's the haves yet, and the have nots. Yeah. Yet yeah. look how important the backup quarterback yeah. is. Yeah. And this past year was the year of the backup, and and the Colts almost win the division with Gardner Minshew playing quarterback. Good quarterback, but come on. Yeah. I mean, you almost you almost did it. You not only made it, but with the result the next day. I always say the universe changes with certain things. Maybe if the Colts beat the Texans, maybe the Jags. I don't know what happens, but. You would have made the playoffs, you know, one or two more throws. 
gets you there with Gardner Minshew. You're, you won the game with Beathard, right? Right. The Jags did. So the Jags won a game with C.J. Beathard. A crucial game, the only win they right. had down the stretch. Right, right. Yeah. You know, Backups are so important. Yeah, I, I agree with Coach McGinnis. You know, you've got to have one over the long stretch, but you also need a backup. That's why I'm very curious to know who the Colts' backup is going to be this year because Minshew's a free agent. In right? the playing style of Anthony Richardson. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. look, the Texans had Case Keenum defeat the Titans in a must-have-it yeah. kind of game yeah. up there. Got – had to have had to at least split in the games with Tennessee and Cleveland at the time, but you needed the division win. Yeah. Sure, and you know with the playoff tiebreakers, those division wins are They're extremely everything. important. They're well, everything. Yeah. To, to go back to to Frank's point, that's the thing that I think I'm most encouraged by with the Colts. You talk about you got to have the the coach, the play caller, which Shane Steichen right. both, and the quarterback. I think Gar, or excuse me, I think Anthony Richardson learned a very valuable lesson as a as a young guy, and he said this at the end of the season, and I don't think it was him being cocky or, you know, over the top. He's like, if I'm healthy, I think we're in the playoffs. Right. And wow. I, I think that's more of an accurate statement than, than not because of what we saw in terms of the first month of the season. So just like C.J. Stroud dealing with the concussion, I think with him missing all of that time, it's a very valuable lesson for him I'm very important to this franchise. And, yep. again, that's not him being cocky. We're going to go as far as I'm going to go. In terms of my availability, that's huge for this team. But also, too, with the Colts on the precipice of a playoff spot, with Shane Steichen as the play caller, the offensive mastermind, with a backup quarterback and Gardner Minshew, whose playing style is completely different from that of Anthony sure, Richardson, right. gives you hope that this guy has coached a lot of different styles, a lot of different quarterbacks, and he's had success no matter what style he has to deal with. Uh, what I'm excited about from the Titans' perspective, to your point about the backup quarterback, we can afford one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So can the Colts. Yeah, we. well, you did with Minshew. Yeah. You know, and that's a big right. deal because Joshua Dobbs wanted to stay in yeah. Tennessee and was really trying to and, – and the Titans really wanted him to stay. Cleveland made him a $2 million guaranteed offer. And, and then they cut him. Well, they traded him. Oh, they traded him to yeah, Arizona. They right. traded him to Arizona. But the Titans very much would have – and they would have loved $2 million is not right. exorbitant. Yep. The Titans were so tight against the cap, they could not afford to pay a guy $2 million guaranteed in hopes that he didn't play. Yeah, yeah. And, and, Expensive I mean, insurance. It, they, they couldn't afford – I mean, you know – We've all been there at different times when we were young buying car insurance. Yeah. We'd love to buy the best, but yeah. we can't afford it, so we buy just what we can afford to get by so we're legal. Mm. And that's where the Titans were. This year, if they want to spend $2 million, $3 million guaranteed on a savvy backup quarterback, they can do it. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, listen, I got one other thing as we wrap here. What's the most? We're rapping? Well, unless we don't. <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, Who's what, running this yeah, show? We're not really, yeah, we're, what's the one or two things that the Titans need to do? Give me two. Well, they've got to fix the offensive line, and they've got to add speed at wide receiver. Offensive line, speed at wide receiver. What about you? Devin Singletary is a free agent, so they've got to address running back and the running game. They have to run the ball consistently. They get the best season ever out of Devin Singletary. That was his best year ever, yeah. over 900 yards. But – He's a free agent. they got to figure out what they're doing because you have to take, as great as C.J. Stroud played, you have to take some heat off of him. You want to be balanced, especially in that system that they're running. Two things. Uh, as it relates to the Colts missing the playoffs last year, I think that the two biggest things that, that held them back were, it's pretty easy, big plays on offense, not enough, and too many big plays allowed on defense. They had 51 sacks last year, which was a franchise record. Yeah. And they actually finished top five in the NFL in sacks on defense. Wow. But it's just the, the timeliness, right? They don't have that guy yet. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Joey Bosa, right. Nick Bosa, TJ Watt. Like the guy that in the high leverage situation, games on the line, he's unblockable. The Colts right. don't have that guy yet. So they're still in search of that. Um, trying to figure out what they're going to do with Michael Pittman Jr., but I think the biggest things are stop the big plays on defense, which we saw in Week 18 with Nico Collins, and not enough big plays on offense. I think some of that boils down to Gardner Minshew versus Anthony Richardson because the big plays were there at the beginning of the season with AR, but just trying to 
marry those two things together. And we're all talking about some of the same thing. By the way, we can go all day. I got nowhere to be. No, no, so, but, what, but let me, but, what for Jacksonville? Yeah, but I will tell you, for us, we have to get more physical. You saw it in that game. We have to get more physical. Uh, that, that's the thing on both lines of scrimmage. Now, look, uh, I sound like I'm making excuses for them, but their offensive line was banged up all year. Devon Hamilton had a health issue. That, that he was a fantastic two-gap nose guard and two years ago, and then he had a health issue and was never himself. Right. Foley Fadakasi didn't play very well. So the lines of the big people, if you t- – I want uh, – free agency draft, I want a bunch of poundage <laughs> because, okay, yeah. because Some LBs. We, we need yeah. LBs because that's what the Jags need, more physicality. It's like the opposite of everybody else. Yeah, they want speed. Yeah, yeah. I think the Jags kind of have the periphery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They need they need physicality and got to be able to run it, got to be able to stop the run. I sound like a coach, but they, that's what they weren't. They doing. don't have a physicality problem when they play the Colts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hear you. You know yeah. what I mean? I do. I do. But that's, that's, that's the big thing, yeah. I think, for them. All right, I've got to read this. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. Mark Vandenberg, the champ, Houston Texans. (laughs) Matt Taylor, Indianapolis Colts. Frank Frangie, Jacksonville Jaguars. Mike Keith, Tennessee Titans. This has been a blast. I love doing Thank this. Thank you, Mike. I love how we do it every year. Thanks for putting it together and, and the technology you bring to the world. And, uh, and, and <laughs> I hope we do this every year. I love this. Thanks for listening to the OTP. Welcome to the big show where the legends go.